Hello, all of you. Vi ste kad sam čuci, kad su podcast Life the Butterfield. Today, I have a truly amazing guest. Um, I try to summon uh, everything in one sentence, but it's very difficult. Imagine those moments in your life when you had a dream to become something and you become that person. In this instance, my guest becomes the pilot. Not just the pilot. He flew the biggest jets, fattest jets, jets in the skies above us. However, the dream has been shattered with uh, events in his personal life. And today we're going to learn how he faced his stark reality or mentality and awakening intensive care, the pilot, the people with the best health on this planet. I guarantee you that one. Today, ladies and gentlemen, my guest in studio, Cran Middleton, directly from Brisbane, actually, about in studio with me. Cran, welcome to the podcast, Life to Butterfield. Oh, my pleasure to be here, Mario. Thank you so much for having me. Look, I try to, I try to, uh, uh, try to make the one sentence about your life, but it's difficult because, like, I think that you are representing every living soul on this planet. So now, let's go start with the little Cran, Cran, who wanted to become the pilot. Guide us to that process. Why did you want to become the pilot? How did you become the pilot? Why not? Why haven't you afraid of the fly in the sky? Yeah. I, I don't know. I cannot say why. I do not know why. Mm. I mean, my grandfather was a pilot. My father's a pilot. And my, it, it just, that's all I ever wanted to do. I, I wasn't interested in taking on any other task. I just wanted to fly. And that's just the end of it. And when I, um, when I was young, I just, I just gravitated to anything aviation. That's all I ever wanted to do. And so just being around aeroplanes, my, my father ran a aircraft maintenance facility for a long okay. time and I used, I used to go with him on weekends to to on saturday mornings go down to the airport with my dad and it's just where i wanted to be it's my happy place i knew exactly where i wanted to be it was just my happy place and it still is it has been for a very long time okay before we continue uh, uh your growth into the become the pilot from dreams to the pilot may i ask you one personal question to answer for all of us why people give up on their dreams because you know as a kid i always say to people be careful what you wish for I want to become the soldier, become the soldier and officer in the military. Um, you become the pilot. But why do people give up on their dreams even when they're adults? Now from this I, 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 I see, because I, as uh, you see on my website, I do a lot of work with young people and uh, doing aviation uh, science workshops at primary schools. And my favourite group to work with are the lower primary years, the, you know, the year four, you know, four, five, six years of age yeah those little people have not learned how to fail i'm absolutely convinced we are not born knowing how to fail if we were born knowing how to fail we'd never walk you're learning to walk it's just failure after failure after failure but it doesn't stop a young person and as i watch young people grow i see this fear of failure creep in from about the age of nine these young people they they clam up and they become reserved. They they lose this desire to learn out of fear of failure. It, it's terrible, and I think it manifests itself greatly in us as adults because we fear failure. We fear a negative outcome, and I think the school system has a lot to answer for because we still stigmatize failure as a bad thing as something to be avoided. And I think people give up on their dreams out of fear of failure. Fear of failure. That's what you're fear of failure. It is going to be hard. That's, anything that's, that's worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. Anything worthwhile is going to be hard. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take dedication. That's it doesn't matter what you choose. It's going to be hard work. It's going to take dedication. But the fear of failure, I think, is incredibly powerful. I think that you would just answer something, but most of the most of us they don't want to admit that we choosing not to do something because we are afraid to fail. But Cran, mm -hmm. thank you for sharing this with us. Cran, and then you become the pilot. You become the pilot of a night. How long took you? What sacrifices you need to put in place to become the pilot? Which obviously majority of the pilots go through that through that ordeal to become the pilots like yourself. Mm -hmm. The I, I wanted to fly. That's all I wanted to do. So I had to find a way. 
it's very expensive. There's and there's very there's no way of really avoiding the expense of being able to learn to fly. It's huge. And um, I remember from a very young age, my father told me uh, he, he was an aviator as well. He yeah. said, "Listen, mate, if you want to fly airplanes, you're paying for it yourself." <laughs> <laughs> he, right from the word go, right from the word go. And I, yeah. but it didn't phase me, Mario. It mm-hmm. didn't. Okay, yeah, it's going to cost me a lot of money. I'll figure it out. I, I, you know, at one stage, I was working full time by day, delivering pizzas at night, and just just trying to save every cent I could. And that's where that that journey took me on to some. Uh, you know, good enough jobs. It wasn't my dream. It wasn't following my passion, but it was the necessary part, a necessary ingredient to achieve my goal is to having multiple jobs and doing whatever I had to do to make it happen. And at that, you know, on Friday nights, I was out delivering pizzas where my mates were all out partying and, you know, chilling out. And here I was driving around the suburbs delivering people's pizzas. Um, and so, yeah, there are sacrifices, but unfortunately, there's no real way around that. You see, there, there is no way. You've got to be prepared to do the hard yards. So, as you drop to dig here, you, you say something very important with the most of people mumbo jumboing, and a lot of public speakers actually, they don't know how to answer this straight away. You had a dream, and you knew what your father told you because, you know, I, I know this, I heard several stories approximately how much it's going to cost, and you can see on websites. I think it's commercial license about uh, about hundred thousand dollars or something. This is ridiculous yeah. money. It's just that yeah. ridiculous money. This is not a credit. This is mortgage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you manage to work several jobs. You knew that your bodies have the good time, but you save the money, and you turn it impossible into possible. And I think that itself, by default, it is the benchmark. I think that people should, you know, lean and learn from you spectacularly awesome approach to the life so you become the pilot how long took you to become the pilot it, it took me quite some time for that that very reason of the expense of it i had okay. to save up the money and i had to be doing it part-time so i had my my basic pilot's license referred to as what they call the restricted private license when i was still in high school mm-hmm. um that got me uh to the point where i could take my friends flying i used to take my teachers flying my teachers my school teachers i took them flying Mm-hmm. And <laughs> but see, part of the challenge of that was I needed someone with a car and a driver's license to get me to the airport because I could fly the airplane, but I couldn't drive the car. What so I, 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 there was sort of method in my madness here. I take my teachers flying, but I needed that. I needed them to get me to the airport. So that's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, um, yeah. But you have to oh, you have to be driven by your passion. You really can have I, to be by your passion. Can you, if you can recall, I truly believe maybe you can, your very first time on your solo flight, not, not with instructor, when you've done the, your solo flight, there's a crown sitting behind the, the, the cockpit, in the cockpit with the columns and the, and the instruments in front of him on his solo flight. Can you share with our audience, what is that experience when your dream become reality? It was mid-morning on the 25th of April, 1997. It was a Friday. I had to go back to school on the Monday. I was in a Cessna 152 registration Bravo uniform Echo off runway 07 at Redcliffe Airport. You never forget your first solo flight. I I got out. I, the We were doing circuits, so we we're practicing circuits. And I yeah. knew I was, I was feeling confident. I knew I was getting close to solo. And the instructor said, his name was Robert, and he said, okay, make this landing a full stop which means we okay. We, rather than landing, continuing the roll and taking off again and practicing what we call touch and goes, he said, make it a full stop. Okay. And it didn't feel, we normally do an hour. And it didn't feel as I'd been doing an hour's worth of training. Anyway, we cleared the runway, taxied off. He said, okay, you're ready for your first solo. Stop here. He jumped out, shut the door. He said, go do a lap by yourself. And I have never had so much adrenaline pumping through my body at any one time. I started, I, I was just like, it's like, oh, yes, I'm going to do it. Then all of a sudden the reality of, oh, strike, I've got to do it. I have to do this now. It's up to me. I got the aeroplane airborne. And once I was up, there, there's no instructor. It's totally up to me to get it down. Mm-hmm. So I took oh, off. I did, I did the lap around and landed by myself. And it was just the, I, I can't even come close to sharing 
how it felt. It was just incredible. And like I say, I had to go back to school on Monday. It was a Friday and I had to go back to school on the Monday because uh, it was a public holiday. And I, it was, it's, it was just such a surreal, surreal, surreal experience. And it, I'm, yeah, I'm, it I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just like all over the moon, you know, because uh, you know, while you were saying the date, so 27 years ago, you remember the exact date, radio on a, on a, on an airplane, <laughs> the runaway. <laughs> yeah. It was a Friday midday. Mm-hmm. That is that when the dream becomes reality. Yeah, that is that a dream. It. Yeah, that is that yeah. is it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Tell us, really. When when you start flying, obviously, you know the the the, the smaller aircraft, and you, you want to now transition onto a bigger plane. So obviously, it's a different approach. It's a much more learning. It's a much more education. It's much more training. It's it's the seriousness becomes you know the the, the maximum because you're gonna fly the passengers one day, not just yourself. You know, so mm-hmm. can you guide us that that part? from transitioning from from recreational pilot, uh, restricted pilot license, sorry, you said, mm-hmm. to the commercial pilot? Um, <laughs> my biggest challenge was trying to fund it and getting the money for it. I never really had much of a problem with the flying. It certainly had its challenges. Uh, one of my, aside from the funding, which is an obvious one, one of the biggest challenges I had was this innate need that I thought I had to be perfect. I thought I had to execute every manoeuvre with as close to perfection as I possibly could. I wasn't until I was flying jet aeroplanes in my early 30s, by the time I finally woke up to myself, that that is the worst thing you can do. I firmly try to, don't be perfect. That's the worst thing you can do because what it does is it stifles good. Perfection or the striving thereof gets in the way of good. And by trying to be perfect, it distracts from the job at hand. So that expression we've all of us have heard, practice makes perfect, I absolutely despise. I absolutely despise that expression because it's a lie. I firmly believe that perfection is unattainable. You might get to what you think was perfection, but then it won't be good enough. You're constantly looking for your inadequacies. You're constantly looking for what was wrong rather than celebrating what you did right. And so one of the biggest challenges I had as a young pilot was trying to deal with this this self-imposed pressure of striving for perfection. That really made it difficult. And it was all self-inflicted. It was completely and utterly self-inflicted. I had no one to blame but myself. So now when I speak to young people or speak yes. to anyone, it doesn't matter if I'm speaking with a group of, you know, 100 corporate executives from a major US bank institution, whether I'm speaking to five young people in a school, I firmly, firmly put forward the notion that perfection doesn't exist. Even Stephen Hawking said that. Arguably the most intelligent person to ever live said perfection simply does not exist. Without imperfection, neither you nor I would exist. Stephen Hawking said that. So I replace that expression with practice makes perfect. I despise it. What I tell young people, tell anyone I'm speaking to, replace it with practice creates confidence. Practice creates confidence confidence when you and your whole approach will change at that point practice creates confidence because then you'll be confident with the less desirable outcomes where your performance wasn't there but what you'll start to see those as learning opportunities you'll see the learning opportunities in your less desirable outcomes practice creates confidence and then you'll be confident in what you're going to learn I would go into a simulator check and I would wind myself up into the most horrendous pool of anxiety. <laughs> and I'd, I'd have this one tiny, t- to give you an idea, Mario, as I drove to work, every aeroplane has a list of emergency memory items. And as the name implies, you must know them from memory. You've got to be able to execute them from memory. All of it's them. Like all of them. It's an, it's an engine failure on the runway. You don't have time to pull out a checklist you have to be able to execute the procedure from memory. So what I used to do, 
I used to record them on my on my phone, but why in the dark, dark, dark old days, I used to record them. You remember those things called cassette tapes? Yes, of course I do. I, like <laughs> I used to record it on before we had these so-called smart devices. Yeah, yes, yes. I would record the emergency memory items on cassette tape, and as I drove to work, I'd practice them. I'd listen and practice the magic memory items as I drive to work. Mm, mm, mm. With the advent of smart devices, I recorded them on my phone. <laughs> and so I'd practice them and I'd listen to them. I knew those procedures extremely well. I knew them extremely well. My problem was I was trying to be perfect. And what I didn't realize was when I got into the simulator and I had to demonstrate these non-standard procedures, the dynamic was different. Yeah. I knew them really well in the car driving to work. You then throw in the complication of having to fly the aeroplane. I'd make a tiny stuff up. I'd stuff so I'd make a tiny, tiny error. The check captain probably didn't even notice. But then I'd start kicking myself something. Oh, come on, Cran, you know you know these procedures. That's stupid. I was then distracted. I'd make another tiny error. Yeah. I'd start kicking myself for that. And so it was this self-sustaining horror story of requiring perfection and not achieving it. Now I go into a simulator check and I'll give myself what I call an error budget. I'm error not budget. going that's a, that's a good one. Actually. Yeah, please, yes, error yeah. budget. We are allowed. We're human beings, Maria. We're allowed to stuff things up. We're allowed to make mistakes. So I'll go into a simulator check and say, I am going to completely and utterly stuff up 20% of it. We're going to nail the other 80. And then from that moment on, I started doing that. It was from a very wise check captain gave me that advice. His name was Bruce. And from that moment on, my simulator checks and my standards and my performance improved because I allowed myself to make mistakes. Imperfect did not mean I'm unsafe. Imperfection does not mean I'm unsafe. It means I'm human. And I'm allowed to make that. We are all allowed to make mistakes. And that attitude, there is no reason why that attitude that I used in the cockpit can't be brought into the boardroom. That's when I, I speak I agree, to. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. When I when I speak at the corporate level, uh, I have one keynote called "My Cockpit to Your Boardroom." And so the all the, these strategies, which saw me in terms of success flying uh, heavy jets across a good part of the globe, how they can be adapted and how you can then use those to guide your team members in your corporate setting. Granted, the task is vastly different. You're not flying a heavy jet, but I'm not running a multinational, multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. But the strategies can be used regardless of the setting. Can I, you know, first of all, I want to say I concur with you. I, I never fly the plane as you did. I never had been in a situation like you did. I have nothing to say except one thing. I want to just say I concur when you say uh, practice um, creates confidence, right? And one thing what I learned in the army as well, they told us practice makes you uh, permanent. So you repeating, repeating, repeating that, you know, I mean, by repeating the same uh, action so and over again, you're becoming, you know, I mean, a customized to the, to the problems and anything else, how to solve them. So I, I really admire what you said, but, you know, then you say, error budget you know like don't seek perfection we allow to do the mistakes and yeah. what what makes it even more desirable for anybody to to listen to you and interview you and hire you to be the guest speaker on the corporate uh, gigs is that what you said that error budget that we need we can allow ourselves mistakes but that in any moment you are not unsafe for passengers you know, mm -hmm. that's a big statement, you know what I mean? Because yeah. when you say like, oh, I could do the budgeting, you know, sorry, the mistakes, I'm like, mm, is that normal for the planes? But you say like, no, no, I'm beating myself down, so mentally. So when you become the, the passenger jet pilot, is that how you say, or it's like- no, Airline pilot. pilot? Airline pilot, so that's, what's, that's, so that's the proper one. I try to find, there's so many definitions online, <laughs> and the holy grail of the knowledge Google gives me a, a jet airliner. So. Do you remember your first flight on a on a jet line? Jet line, so airline, jet line, passenger jet, big plane. <laughs> yeah, my first day of what we call line training. So you go through the simulator type training. So well, I'm, I'm qualified on four different airliners. 
-hmm. And the simulators are that good. You get the qualification having never flown the real aeroplane. And my very first day of line training, uh, I was with a captain named Luke, and he was he's still a dear friend of mine to this day. And uh, I think we did a um, a Brisbane Sydney return, and I can't. I think we did four sectors. But I remember how intense it was. It was the focus point was it took a lot of intense training, and I remember taxiing in in this you know fifty sixty ton aeroplane, thinking I can't believe I'm actually doing this. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just just yeah, you know, and. I was in, I was on the air side amongst all the other big jets, and it was just yeah, yeah. not quite not as good as my first solo. That that's just a whole new level of the first solo. Yeah. But your first time flying a big jet, you know, you push back, you line up on the runway, you push up those thrust levers, you push back into your seat, you're still on the ground at 300 kilometers an hour. You pull back on that stick and you aim for the blue. It's just the best best job in the world. Oh, best job in the world, huh? I love it. <laughs> I bet that it is subjective, yo. You have yeah, the best that view, is... that's for sure. You know, me being in the cockpit. So, okay, let me let me guide now. You know, you are not just a pilot, but you're responsible. I will say this for the souls on, on a plane. You know, like mm-hmm. the, the passengers, because every time you sit in a plane, you don't just push the levers in. I mean, the engine to fly. There's a whole lot, as you say checks and the balances and you know uh the the the, the risks you need to calculate that uh, is the engine working i have no idea what actually involves you know i mean except we can i can copy from the movies or from the some easy jet was doing some type of the um, documentary you know the flying and you uh pilots training and everything else but what is the feeling what takes to fly the plane what is a you crying wake up in the morning or in a day before how this procedure works for you as a human you know tomorrow gonna fly sydney brisbane let's go say what is what takes you as a, as a pilot to fly that plane in the morning it starts before i even leave home mm-hmm. it's it's not just okay in the airport turn the keys let's go i i say for instance i'm doing a I don't know, an early morning departure the evening before, I've already started to think about the weather. I look at the weather, what I'm expecting. The weather's a big one because that's, that's the most variable, the biggest variable you've got, which is completely beyond the control of a pilot. But you don't like surprises. So you, you're thinking way ahead of the aeroplane. Before you've even gotten into the car to go to the airport, you're thinking about things like the weather. And the weather of your destination, whether the destination going has a curfew, whether... Uh, you know they're doing, you know, you were down there last week and you saw that they were doing some um, earthworks nearby the airport. Maybe they're now doing that closer to the runway, which might reduce the amount of runway we have available. You're already thinking about those things. What time of year it is. So, like, for this time of year in winter in Australia, if yes. we're going west to, say, Brisbane to Perth, we I know we're going to have very strong headwinds. I know we have very strong headwinds. I'm going to have to put on more fuel. I'm going to be burning a lot more fuel. It will take me nearly six hours to get to Perth, but it will only be just over three, you know, uh, three to four hours coming home because I'll have the tailwinds with me. So I'm already thinking about those fuel uplifts and whether, okay, I may have to, depending on what freight there is, I may have to offload some freight or not take freight with me. Yeah. So but you're thinking about all this. Oh, most of that just comes with experience, though. Yes. You know, that comes with experience, and you're thinking ahead of the game before you even get to the airport. And... Uh, Pulling it all together, and it's t- tremendously satisfying. And I found was when you get these instincts good, you get to the airport, you get into the aeroplane, and you get airborne. You fly the the flight, come into land. I'm delivering however many hundred people to their loved ones, and it just feels really good to know you, you, I'm making a bit of a difference to these people's lives, even though I don't know them. I'll never meet them personally, or very few of them. You know, it's because of what I do and my colleagues that we can create a really great culture and a safe culture um, for the people we uh, we fly around. So that, you know, this is what, the reason why I ask you this. You see, I expect you're going to answer some type of that way when you say my flight doesn't start when I when I sit in a plane, right? It starts the night before and comes with the with the with the with the practice and with the life experience and work experience. So thank you for 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 sharing these thoughts with with all uh, listeners and viewers of this podcast because uh, ladies and gentlemen, Cad Middleton started his career as a dream and you know he financed his dream 
and he turned it impossible into possible. One thing you need to take it from this interview so far, it is that perfection doesn't exist. So I need to dig deep into this conversation with the Quran. And secondly, what the Quran says, you know, the job doesn't start with the moment you are walking to the uh, into the building, you know, your office, you need to start a little bit earlier, as the Quran says. So Quran, how many hours did you, how many hours did you fly? And how do you, how, how do you uh, calculate those hours? It says hundreds, thousands. W- w- what is your what is your score, your tally of the hours of flying? Oh, we have this wonderful document called a logbook. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> you know, I like it. I like it. You know, <laughs> I, I think I'm up to my third logbook now, and I'm I'm around eight and a half thousand hours flying. Um, uh, which is actually, you know, I'd be well over. I'll be well into that five figure mark into the ten thousands had I not lost my my. Uh, Mm. my career because of my health issues uh yeah and you keep these log books and um track that down we we take it um sector for sector so in a multi-crew environment so as the captain and myself you see up here i've only got three bars so yeah. i was the first officer i was this close i was so close to getting my command when i got sick which is uh, that's still a hard pill to swallow yeah. but we would we'd share the flying pretty much 50 50. he'd do a flight i'd do a flight and that's how we'd work it, and we just tally them up. And it's not, you know, a career pilot who uh, has a fairly uneventful career. It's not not uncommon to see eighteen, twenty thousand hours in a logbook. Um, so that's 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 yeah. a lot, once. So let me, ask, let, me, let me let me let me uh, ask you some light uh, um, teams, lighter teams. So yeah, I want you to now uh, to this interview. I want you to build this um, momentum. Why people should get Crown Middleton on their podcast or TV shows. Guys, I'm going to put the comment section below all Crown details. And reason for that it is, we started with a dream. A dream converted into reality. A reality, it's come up to eight and a half thousand flying hours. Eight and a half thousand flying hours. Guys, that's a, that's a lifetime for many of us, you know, I mean, to work. Responsibility, accountability of this guest on my crown it's 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 incredible he doesn't care only for the passengers but for the uh, property and for the airports for the for the the list goes on being pilot is not just a sitting in a cockpit it's variety of the responsibilities accountabilities but one thing what we don't see it's what the pilots do in the cockpit and i want to ask you a question now crown once for all should be should be we afraid asking for the friend? Should we ask? Should we be afraid of the turbulences or not? And what the uh, turbulences are, please. I know you get this question mm, quite often, but mm. who better man to ask than yourself? Uh, I, I, it's coming up uh, quite a bit lately. I've seen a lot of, <laughs> and I think the, the thing is now we've all got a camera in our in our pocket. Yes, people are videoing severe turbulence, and and unfortunately, severe turbulence gets. It's actually not that common. People are claiming it's getting a whole lot more common, and and maybe it is claiming it's a result of global warming. And uh, maybe it yeah. is. I haven't really looked into it. Yeah. I think it's got a lot more common now because people are posting it all over social media. Mm. Um, I have only once, maybe twice, experienced true severe turbulence, and we've got procedures. As soon as we, if we know we've got an area where it's completely severe turbulence, we'll slow down. We'll get now the airplane's got we designed as a turbulence penetration speed where at that speed we can hit turbulence and the airframe won't be damaged and also you speak to other pilots um like like i said earlier this time of year going west it can be some really really strong headwinds to um in the southern hemisphere going west here and that can be associated with turbulence so i'm already thinking about okay what levels we should be at we speak to other pilots who might be a couple of hundred miles ahead of us and saying, oh, what's okay. the what's the ride like at thirty four thousand feet? We're at thirty two. We might look at climbing. We look at that. But if anyone is genuinely fearful of turbulence, mm, yes, what I'd suggest you do is go on to YouTube and look up a Boeing triple seven wing test. Now, this was the airplane has to meet certain criteria of stress, and they video these. And once it meets its criteria, that's great, job done. But they keep bending this wing until it catastrophically fails. 
And that is virtually impossible for that to happen in real life, short of being, uh, honestly, uh, for something to fail as a result of turbulence. When you see this wing, it's bent up almost at 90 yeah. degrees before it fails. There is such strength in these aeroplanes and some of the masters of engineering that go into them. That reassures the aeroplane itself is a very strong, very safe vehicle to be in. And engineers know they're going to hit turbulence. So that they are designed to, with that in mind, to have a good safety margin. Aircraft, I mean, the aviation rules, they're written in blood from decades and decades of experience and outcomes. We have very stringent rules for very good reason. Yes. And that's why aviation is the safest form of transportation you can you can have. And making sure that these uh, aircraft are well-maintained. I mean, my father was an aircraft engineer and um, I remember my dad telling me, uh, when I was very young, he said, just because you're a pilot doesn't mean you're better than anyone else, okay? <laughs> and he was absolutely right. Mario, he was absolutely spot on because we're all part of a big team. The air yes. traffic controllers, the maintenance engineers, the pilots, the flight attendants, I can't do my job without them and they can't do my job without me. We're all part of a big team. Um, but yeah, in terms of turbulence, have a look at some of these wing stress tests on YouTube. And it'll just blow you away how far they can stretch these wings before they break. And it'll give you confidence you're in a very safe machine. Look, for me, it's a confidence now in speaking to you. Like, you know, no, nobody likes the shaking and, um, you know, nobody loves, you know, this moving. I'm always surprised seeing people on a plane, you know, the plane just a little bit shake it. And, you know, I'm always like, you know, like, and then yeah. many people's like, oh. I say, how yeah. they can even sleep, man? I mean, <laughs> just I just yeah. want to lay, lay down, lay down. I know it's a subconscious. My my mind says to me, my don't worry, but you know, my body's like, you know, just becoming sort of um unhappy with that with those moments. But you know, confidence what gives me is a people like yourself. And I'm truly hoping that everybody who is listening now watching this podcast, uh, feel free to uh, jump on uh Craig Middleton uh, website, contact him and ask him uh, all the questions you have about flying because Kran, he flies the jets. In jets are the people, the goats. And they have a crash accident, which means he's great, he's good, he knows what he does. But then he hit his own turbulence. So Kran, you say something that your dream come to the short living because of your medical uh, episode, right? Can you tell us how did you dealt, what's happened and how did you deal with, with that type of turbulence because nobody could prepare you for such a thing? You're exactly right, uh, Mario. It, it's, I was not prepared. I was absolutely not prepared. So I was in Tokyo uh, oh. on an overnight and just woke up, uh, got uh, had a coffee, stepped out of the coffee shop, and was walking back to uh, get back to the hotel. And I, heck, if I don't sit down, I'm going to fall down. I had fatigue, the most savage fatigue just hit me so quickly. Anyway, I, I managed to get myself together and get back to the hotel. And a very long story short, I went to the doctor and I was diagnosed with uh, glandular fever. And I thought, okay, no big deal. Give me a few weeks. You'll be right back to work. Nine months later, I was no better. I started going to, I can't remember how many specialists. I finally went to a neuropsychologist and he said, I'm just going to do an MRI just to be safe. I don't expect to find anything, but we just have to tick the box. And they found a lesion. They found a lesion deep between the hemispheres of my brain. It was about the size of an almond. The doctor said, don't be concerned. The 10% of the population have them. It won't change. We'll do another MRI in 12 months to prove it's stable. And we'll give you a letter. And you'll be back flying. Okay, so I tread water for 12 months. After 12 months, it had changed shape a little bit. And I said, give it another 12 months, and it had definitely gotten bigger. From the middle of 2019 to the end of 2019, it grew 11 millimetres. It doubled in size in six months. It got really aggressive. And that's when the surgeon says, I'm sorry, mate, we're going to have to go in. That's going to get nasty. And on the 6th of January 2020, I lay in intensive care, not knowing if I'll be able to fly again. I've now got four titanium pins holding my skull together. And 
on the way home from hospital, I sustained a seizure and that left me with what appears to be irreversible brain damage. It's nothing major. I'm allowed to drive, but it's not to the standard required to be an airline pilot. That absolutely crushed me. I, I cannot even come close to describing how crushing it was to know I can't fly anymore. So what do you, that's the worst thing you can tell a pilot. The worst thing you can tell a pilot is that he can no longer fly. So I had to find a new reason to get out of bed in the morning. I had to find a new reason to be motivated. And like I said earlier, I was completely unprepared for what happened. I was completely, completely unprepared. I saw you, just to interrupt you here, like when I, when I saw you uh, on LinkedIn, uh, you come across as, as a searcher, and then our friend Alexandra, she's uh, officially introduced us. Um, you know, when I saw you in the bed and everything else, it's like, just a second, this guy is, is a pilot, you know, image, and I mean, and LinkedIn profile picture, then it's like, you know, you're in, in the hospital. <clears throat> I said, like, that must be very difficult and hard to, to swallow. But again, it, it's nothing can prepare you for that, 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 that type of the event in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not a airplane. Um, yeah. So how did you reacted when you find out you know obviously through medical to say to cran wings down and i mean goodbye i had to find a new why um i had to find a new reason and i was i'm actually being very blessed in one regard that i have found that reason mm -hmm. and that is to help others be prepared like i said i wasn't prepared I didn't have those tools. I've had to find that out myself. I've gone through some incredibly, incredibly difficult times. And now I have a real passion for empowering others, whether it be through corporate keynote or even just like we're doing now, it's just having a, having a quiet, quiet uh, podcast chat. I really enjoy that too. I've been there. I've done it. I've been in the pit of depression. I've suffered mental illness. I've been there. I know how it feels. I know how it feels to have your a job you absolutely love taken from you. So now it's time to give to others. It's now time to find a way to help others be prepared. It was certainly something I was never given in my high school. So I really, really love empowering young people, sharing my story and giving them these tools of how to be prepared. Like, like, don't expect to be perfect. Forget perfection. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Tough times are going to come. There is no way to avoid it. They are going to hit. Life is going to come and belt you so hard one day, you're going to feel like giving up. But that is not the only option. And I can speak from personal experience. I have been there. I know how it feels. And I really can give these skills and these tools that have got me through those tough times to empower young um, anyone but i really have a passion for empowering young people trying to be that person i wish i had when i was their age trying to be that person who just you was just who has some idea and is happy to share those ideas you said something at the, at the beginning of the interview that uh schools don't equip you uh with the, with the certain skills you know um to to fail, you know, I mean that the kids yeah. instead of the kids kids are not being taught that they can fail that you know instead of these are going in a different direction. Yeah. You can't fail, you know, you cannot fail. The failure is not allowed, and all these things. And I wish, no wishes, truly employing everybody, all schools across Australia, across the globe. Speak with these gentlemen. Speak to my guest, Cran. You know, I don't know that feeling. When I left the military after 14 years, I felt a little bit, you know, naked, but I was struggling in different type of service in government uh, and diplomacy. So, like, you know, that transition was for me sort of okay. But from one day you're flying to the next day you don't fly. So one day you have your dream, you know, what you're doing the best and what you do, what you want to do most is being taken away from you because of the medical condition. And then you're saying this 
with an all open heart that you suffer depression. So how did you deal with depression? So let's go, let's go arm equipped other people who's listening to this and watching this podcast crime from being the first officer in the cockpit of the big massive jets to be in depression. What did you done to help yourself? I, the first thing you got to do is it's okay. It's okay to be depressed. You, you wouldn't kick yourself for having a head cold or if you tripped over and twisted your ankle and couldn't go to work for a few days, you wouldn't think anything of that. There's no shame in admitting you're struggling mentally. It's absolutely okay. There are some amazing people out there who can help you. There is no shame in medication. It's absolutely okay. I got back, I went through my period of depression and I, for a brief, for a period there, I managed to get back flying whilst I was under, while I was taking medication. Mm. It's, and that's absolutely fine. The uh, aviation doctors, I had to go through some very strict assessments. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah, However, course, yeah, yeah. For, for good reason. However, I still could maintain a class one pilot's medical while I was having medication. And I can assure you there are thousands of pilots who do the same thing. Yes. What's the worst thing you can do is keep going, keep going and ignoring and pretending everything's okay when it is not. That is the worst thing you can do because it's not going to get any better if you just ignore it. All right. And don't be afraid to talk about it. This is where I, I, I love being a sounding board for some people um, because I've been there. And if someone, I, I will, I'm happy to sit with anyone. And sometimes you can be that person who helps out too by just listening and not stigmatizing you know, mental illness as being something so horrendous to be avoided and we can't talk about it. It happens to virtually everybody. And sometimes it can be you just listening, not judging, not, not, you don't have to have the answers. You don't have to know exactly what to do at exactly the right time, but just be that one to listen. That's and why that can make a huge difference to people. That's why such a job is like, it's makes it so happy that you are here today with me because I know your time is valuable. I know that you have other things to do in your life, but I truly believe that you sharing your message right now with our audience or life the battlefield anybody who is watching this right now this is the man you need to look for you know why i'm saying this uh the 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 crown the courage it's it's a mental thing and everybody loves to talk about being strong being the man the alpha male the killer the this and that but in reality i know this because i lost several of my friends in in military who suffered something that from depression and uh, you know they just took their own life in front of me like and I was like what what's happening now but you you saying to people don't don't worry nobody has the right to judge you that everybody has problem mentally you know what I mean mm-hmm. you can have medications that you everybody can experience that that problems that's what I'm so grateful that you shared this you know what I mean yes. the man who fly the planes fly the passengers says it's okay to yeah, as a as absolutely a, okay. okay to be depressed absolutely okay. and your your power your message is more stronger than anything else I can see in a commercial TV ads on the radios and anything else because that's the real story and I want people to reach you and I mean like I want to reach you much more bigger TV stations and radio stations to you pass this message because you are not just inspiration you know but you are somebody who we can look high and say like this man dreams has been taken away but he gives us reasons to live you say something you need to find your reasons uh, sorry, your why, new reason, why yep. to exist, why to live, why to work. So what did you, how did you find your new why? How did you find, did you wake up one day in the morning? It's like, well, hello, world. My name is Cran. I'm going to do this. <laughs> if, 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 the, the biggest thing, you just can't give up. Just don't give up. Yes, don't you're going to have hard times. There's going to be times which are going to really knock you. Um, the, the most important thing is just not give up. And, just keep keep moving forward. And my love of public speaking, I, I never knew I was going to move into this public speaking role at all. And it happened somewhat by mistake. 
uh, with my friends at the Griffith University and the aviation side of the faculty. They invited me to come and speak to the students there. Yes. And I thought, okay, I, I, yeah, I've, I've got some experience to pass on. I'll yeah. put a few slides together and had a few funny stories. I had these students in stitches and I realised, heck, I'm really enjoying myself here. This is a lot of fun. And that was my light bulb moment for there to see if I can monetize that and sharing these these stories. And that's where I moved forward from there. Uh, my, my STEM education business, which I started in 2016, that was something I wanted to sort of run on the side. And then, but when I got sick, that was actually a real blessing because it gave me something to, to focus on, it gave me that purpose. We all need a purpose. So while I couldn't fly, I had that purpose and we built that up. Unfortunately, COVID absolutely destroyed that business um, because we took pride in getting young people away from these things, away from these mobile phones and iPads and showing them they've got a smart device between their ears. Use that smart device between your ears. And so the whole let's pivot to an online strategy really didn't work because we took pride in kids being tactile. And then the whole ecosystem changed with COVID, as we know. And it was in amongst all that that I discovered that I enjoyed public speaking and that, that people enjoyed listening to it. And so that's where I built up my public speaking business from there. What's the co- most common question? Please tell, share with us. What's the most <laughs> common question? I see, I, I, <laughs> what's the most common question <clears throat> anybody asks on your public speaking? Is it about flying or is something else? Um, with the young people, like, good boy, good uh, it's, like it's the inevitable, <laughs> the inevitable question, have you ever crashed? Is the inevitable question that comes up. And the answer is no, I haven't. Um, but I, 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 I'm not sure why, but particularly with young people, that comes up. <laughs> and so that, that's, that's a, um, I, I'm not quite sure. I can't really explain why, but that's the inevitable one, maybe because they like a, a good story. But I, I keep it, you've got to, particularly with uh, high school students, yes. I, you've got to engage them. So I tell them about the story early on in my career where I went to work and here I was all of maybe 23 and I had to 23, 24 and I got to work and I had to fly a dead body to a funeral. So and I come, had to, come, come again. Yeah. I had to fly. <laughs> I, I was a flying hearse. I had to fly the coffin to a funeral. And anyway, there's a really good practical joke. Well, depending on which side of the joke you're on is whether it's good or not, because they play on the new pilot, you see, and is that because decomposition hasn't taken place, there's still air in the lungs, right? Yeah. And so that as the aeroplane climbs into less, the pressure reduces, the air in the lungs expands. And you're flying along, trying to do your job, and all of a sudden you hear, ah, ah, come from the coffin. Okay. <laughs> and depending on where the air's trapped, it can let I'm go. I'm sorry to laugh at you. Yeah. Right. And so you're sitting there and you think, it's a bit weird. And then if you hear it again, you think, right, oh, so, okay, this is starting to freak out here. Yeah, you because, can't just stop the plane, you know what I mean? The yeah, air, like, <laughs> so, yeah, okay. And the other guy thinks it's hilarious because they don't tell you. It, all it is, it's just the physics, just the air escapes over the yeah. larynx. The larynx is still intact, so it starts, this, this, this dead body in this coffin starts to groan. And the worst thing is that they make you do it at night. And it's like, oh, boy. That That's takes a joke, the, yeah. That's oh, a joke. Yeah. I played a joke with you. Mate, I never had to do it at night. I never had to do it at night. But the um, yeah, it, 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 it takes the excitement level to a whole new. Now I've got to say, flying around a belching flatulent corpse was not exactly my idea of a good time. I'll be right uh, honest doing that. But what it did, it got me out of that. I had to do it. It got me out of the comfort zone. That's another big one. I do. I really push that comfort zone and the benefits of getting out of it, particularly to young people. Is if I wasn't prepared to get out of my comfort zone and do those jobs. There's plenty of other guys lined up who would, and then that would have inhibited me from progressing in my career. So you've got to get out of your comfort zone. But I use that story to illustrate that. I mean, what what teenager or doesn't like you know a burping, farting corpse story? I mean, you got to keep it funny. But I, I bring it in. I keep even on a corporate setting. I uh, I keep it. I keep it very lighthearted, and I've got a lot of fun. I had a time I had a um, an Australian warship take missile lock on me, and I was on my way just off the east coast of Australia. Yep. Uh, that was just holding the day, just holding the day, holding the day. Yeah, in the yeah. 
It turns out that I didn't know this, but they, yeah. they use civilian aeroplanes as target practice it, it, without actually firing the missile. They yeah. practice their procedures, their radio procedures. On this particular morning, old Navy officer forgot to flip the frequency over, and so uh-huh. he, he was broadcasting it to the world when it was only meant to be to his Navy friends. Uh, he forgot to put, he forgot to select the correct frequency. So here we were thinking, what are we doing wrong? Are we restricted area or is not? And yeah, they were using us as uh, as um, to practice their missile lock procedures. That was That's an interesting morning. Really- See, we, we don't know these things, you know, like, no. because, uh, you know, we, we're just sitting there, we're complaining, like, oh, where's my nuts and crackers? And why is no life? Yeah. Why, why the TV doesn't work and all these things? But, you yeah. know, can I just, uh, just, uh, just uh, go a little bit back? You said something about comfort zone. Do you believe the comfort zone is still and as well related? Uh, people don't step out of comfort zone because fear of failure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I make a regular point of sharing a really good infographic, which it talks about the comfort zone, the fear zone, and then outside the fear zone, you have the learning zone, and outside the learning zone, you have the growth zone. Mm. When you're in that fear zone, you lack self-confidence, you you feel judged by others' opinions, and you're really, it's really, really uncomfortable. But in order to get to the learning zone and then ultimately to the growth zone, which then becomes yes. your new comfort zone, you've got to be prepared to get out of what you consider comfortable. You've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that is the same, again, whether I'm learning a new jet, I can assure you when I got to the, the A320, I felt like I was in the, in the fear zone. I hovered between the fear and the learning zone for what seemed like an eternity. It was a huge undertaking flying my first jet. But I made, I stuck with it and I focused and I got into the growth zone and then it became my comfort zone. But if I wasn't prepared to get out of it, I, you know, if you yeah. quit because it gets hard. Yeah. yeah. One, one, one thing struck me because it's like I didn't touch this deliberately purpose. I leave this towards the end. Um, you talk about purpose and you need to find your why. Um, you, you start your career helping people. We are flying doctors. Am I mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, oh, I did fly clinic runs. I did. Uh, I, I did a little bit of emergency, but not much. It was mainly taking the doctors to Still. the remote area clinics to take care of the communities out there. Still, you're the guy who fly the doctors who want to help other people. So oh, I did do a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, you know, I, I mean, maybe maybe it's not the best analogy, but you know, you started that way and you continuously assisting everybody on this planet with your story. Which why is- else Why else we put on this planet, Mario? Yeah. If you're not making, so, if, you, if everything you're doing, you do to help somebody else, you're going to be an extremely happy person. If you, you know, even your podcast, you, you, I, I, you're helping me because I, we're having a great conversation here. Thank you. Appreciate it. We are. And, and just the more you help people, the happier a person you'll be. I'm just extremely blessed that I can help people with doing something I absolutely love. But if it, it's simple things like when you're at the shopping centre, put your shopping cart back in the collection trolley. You're helping someone. You're helping the guy who has to go and collect them. You know, simple things. Just be a, a helpful person and you'll be a far more happier and a content person just even doing the small things. Can I ask you before we before we end up this wind up this conversation? I just want to go back into a cockpit, okay? Sure. Juan, yeah. What are pilots doing when they're flying the plane in the cockpit? I want you to be truthfully honest, okay? I don't think, I don't believe that they're just looking at the instruments and like, what's okay? I want a, I want an honest conversation. I mean, like, I want to tell me what the guys because I know you're keeping plane safe mm-hmm. and everything else. We're gonna come on our destination. But mm-hmm. yeah, you know, pilot or whatever, you know, captain, mm-hmm. first officer. Guys, what are you doing on a plane? Uh, I've got a photo. I've got a photo of me on the flight deck. And <laughs> okay. I was coming back from Perth one, I think it was a Sunday morning, and we are just north of Adelaide um, on our way back. And I had a, a rather cheeky captain took a photo of me. Yeah. And I bring it up and put it in my keynote because it's quite uh, – it's quite funny because I was asleep. Okay. I was asleep. And again, this is something that happens behind the flight deck door. Most people yeah. don't, couldn't believe the pilot's actually sleeping. Now it's called controlled rest. It is a standard procedure. 
it happens all the time. Quite okay, interesting. Now, never, now, never granted, not both pilots at the same time, so <laughs> there is a procedure. So <laughs> the, I'll tell the captain, okay, we want to do a bit of controlled rest. Okay, no worries, take half an hour. And look, if you're flying at the back of the clock at night, you're, the, the, the cockpit's in a comfortable temperature, you're at altitude, it's smooth, it's not a demanding phase of flight, that's when we do it. If we're really busy, obviously we don't. And if it's on a really short flight, we don't either. But on long flights, when it, the time and the situation allows, we do controlled rest. So what we do is we call the cabin crew and said, right, we're having controlled rest up here. Every half an hour, we have to call the cabin. If the cabin doesn't hear from us, they call the flight deck. That's the procedures in place. It happens all the time, and it is a standard procedure to have what we refer to as controlled rest. That can help us out so we're more attuned and more focused for the descent and the landing yeah. demanding part, particularly if you're flying back of the clock, like from the 6 p.m. to, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that back of the clock period, you have to uh, really be, you, you want to be focused for the landing, yes. so having some control rest. The other thing I used to do was study. So what I used to do is have my iPad, and these are techniques I'll bring in when I speak to high school students. I talk about effective study techniques. Yeah. If I printed out hard copies of all the Airbus manuals, without a word of a lie, I'd have a stack of manuals a metre high. And so how do we stay on top of all of that? So I, one of the techniques I did, like I said earlier, I used to listen to my emergency procedures as I drove to work, so I'd study while I was driving, but using flip cards on my iPad. So I could go through the fundamentals of all the systems in about an hour and a half. So I'd use the time to study. That way, I was always on top of the procedures, on top of the systems, yes. so that when a simulated check comes, we got checked twice a year. When that came up, it was the stress. I could control the stress. I wasn't as stressed because I knew I practiced it all the time. I uh, didn't do a massive cram and think, oh, gee, I hope I remember all this because <laughs> I practiced and I was practicing all the time. I was extremely confident with those procedures. So I would do that. And obviously, we've got to keep fuel logs. We want to make sure our fuel burn in the actual aeroplane is comparing that to the the flight plan so we're not losing fuel anywhere. So there's a lot of you know housekeeping procedures we do while we're sitting in cruise. But while we're sitting in cruise, we can we can do other things. And like I said, I used to do a lot of study. You know, Cran, you, you, you literally, you know, I, I, can't, I can't express enough gratitude, you know, that, that you talked to me today. I truly believe, you know, as I said, like I like to do interview second part of our interview with you on a on a flight deck, or in a plane or something somewhere, so like I can ask you more questions, and compare that that flying experiences how you can help the people today because I truly believe there's a lot of young people. I don't know why they're asking. Did you have a crash your plane? But that doesn't make sense. Like, <laughs> I don't know ask, why they asked it either. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know this, yeah, I mean, but uh, I just want to say thank you very much for being my guest today, Kran. I truly appreciate for your last sixty-five minutes with me on 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 air. Uh, it is tremendous um, experience talking to somebody who was flying thousands and thousands of, of human lives, left, right, and center, on all different altitudes. To different weather conditions, and today on the ground, you're helping to millions of people do this interview. And I'm inviting everybody, guys. If you have any questions, or you want to have the crown on a, on your show, or maybe perhaps you want to have that in your corporation, to talk to the real, real pilot. I mean, there's somebody who knows the stuff. Crown is your man. So, Crown, what do you do, and how do you help the people through your public speaking, or the business? You know how they what they're going to expect from you when they when they see you. I, I break down those barriers of perfection. Uh, again, people think these pilots where we're, we're superhuman, you know, amazing guys who are absolutely perfect. Well, I can guarantee you that is not the case. All right. And it's absolutely okay not to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're unsafe. It doesn't mean you're not satisfactory. Imperfection is absolutely fine. And so when I come and speak with your team or at your school, I unpack those fallacies and I re-educate how we look at imperfection. I re-educate how we define failure and seeing it as a great benefit. Like again, success is not the opposite to failure. That's another one we're always thinking. The opposite to failure is successful. No, 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 no. Failure is an essential ingredient along the path to achieve success. 
you have to be prepared to fail. And again, that's something we're not taught in schools. So I love sharing that with young people and empowering young people. But in that corporate keynote setting, and it's it's just as relevant. And I really, really enjoy empowering people, reflecting on my career. And let's have a few laughs along the way. Talking about some funny stories. I mean, who, like I said, who doesn't like a burping, farting, dead body story for a okay, laugh? I, I, was expecting, I was expecting that, you know, that you're going to share that story with us because I truly believe in eight and a half thousand flying hours, there must be more time you laugh, you know what I mean? But there's a times when you're worrying about things as well, which we don't, which we don't see it. We don't, we don't know. And, you know, I always think myself, when I talk to Kran, I'm going to ask him all these questions, but with you, planning questions is impossible because our conversation, the way how you, how you unpack it, success, it's totally opposite what everybody preaching. Failure is not allowed. You say failure is a essential ingredient for success. That's what I wrote. I mean, I know that you yeah. said it's a bit different, but failure is yeah. ingredient on a path to success. And the Crown Middleton is middle coat, sorry, middle coat. It is somebody who you need to talk with. And the Crown, looking forward to see you in person in Brisbane. And let's go do this in a, in a hangar or on a flight deck. You know, let's go see what we can do and how we can uh, bring more people to understand what takes, you know, I mean, not just to fly, but to be the Crown, the man who make the dreams from impossible to possible. You said your father told you. You can be pilot, but I'm not paying. And mm -hmm. you find a way to become the pilot. Absolutely. That's a success itself. Kran, so people can find you on your uh, website, kranlittlecoat.com. And I'm going to put this in the comment section below. Kran, I'd like to say thank you very much for being my guest today. And thank you for truly motivating thousands of people to understand that failure is allowed and it's okay to be depressed as well. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Marin. You're welcome.